Well, they're out there. They're around you. Maybe in your own home. You might notice that you might not, but they're out there. Lavish people still exist in our world. Our, our lavish God wants to transform us into lavish people. And I know they're out there because I've, I've seen them. I've bumped into them. I've encountered them. A couple in the church we served in Michigan for 14 years. A couple who just lived a lavish life. They weren't uber wealthy. They lived, they lived in a farmhouse. And, and they, they loved Jesus. They loved the church. But whenever there was a need, they seemed to kind of find their way there. It's just who they were. They were in it as a couple. They saw what God gave them as not just theirs, but something they kept in open hands. As a matter of fact, at one point, the husband pulled me aside. Kind of a quieter guy. Not a, not a pushy guy. Not a, not a showy guy at all. And he pulled me aside. He said, Pastor, he said, I know there's times that things come up in the church that aren't in the budget. He says, if that ever happens, he says, promise you'll let me know. He said, I'm not guaranteed I can meet the need. I'm not guaranteed I'll have the money at the time. But I want to pray. And if we do have the means and God calls me to do it, we're always going to be ready to share. That's a lavish life. That's a lavish couple. They recognize that God has been lavish with them in so many ways. What Keith talked about a couple weeks ago. They have the wisdom to understand how, how it works in this world when God has been good to you. And they live a lavish life. A woman was sitting at our dining room table here in Monterey. We were having a dinner. Someone was part of this church. And we got talking. We were talking about generosity. We were talking about sharing. We were talking about living a life of really just taking what we have and offering it to the Lord. And this woman says, you know, can I tell you, when I'm trying to figure out what God wants me to give, can I tell you kind of how I do it? I said, sure. I always love to learn how, different, how the Lord works in different kinds of people and how he, he, he stirs their hearts. So she says, well, when I hear about a need in the church or with a Christian organization, when I hear about a need and I feel like God wants me to be part of it, because God can't have us be part of everything, but she says, when I pray and I feel like God wants me to be part of it and I know there's a need, she says, I come up with a number that I'm going to give. This is a true story. Come up with a number, and I just start increasing it in my mind. And I, I keep increasing it till I feel like I have to throw up, she said. She says, and then I know that's probably what God wants me to give. That's lavish and, you know, a little bit lavish. But, uh, it's, but that's, that's uh, somebody who says, I keep thinking about what God wants me to give till I almost feel sick to my stomach because it's going to challenge me so much. And she says, and then I think I'm probably getting in that place of faith I need to be. That's a lavish life. I think of a little boy. A little boy who, when his parents would give him a coat for Christmas or something, or his parents would give him a new toy, he struggled as a young boy because he'd always think about friends of his who didn't have a toy like that or a coat like that. And oftentimes he'd say, would it be okay if I gave this to someone else before he even got to wear it or play with it? And as a young man, he has that same kind of a heart. But it started when he was a little kid. They're out there. They're around us. Lavish people who understand that God has been good. They understand the wisdom of the scriptures for how we should view the stuff of this world. And they live a life being lavish. And sometimes when groups of people get together, they become a lavish group. I know of a church... I know of a church right here in Monterey, a group of lots of people who, who live as a lavish congregation. I know a church that, that, that twice a week, they have a food pantry. And people drive up, and they don't just receive a bag of food. They're offered flowers. They're offered cat food and dog food. They're offered prayer and counsel and friendship. That's lavish. The same church has helped so many other churches in the community. And by the way, if you haven't figured out, that's Shoreline Church. Uh, that's you. That's you. As a, as a church, this is a lavish church. I met with my pastors group this last week. And one of the pastors was showing us the worship center. And this is actually Wellspring Church out in Pacific Grove. And Pastor Tony, who's a dear friend, was talking about the worship center. And, and, and their worship, it's an older, more traditional space. And they've had to kind of blow out the side there and open up to make a little bit more room for people. And they were talking about the sound of that. They said, this room, the sound was so, it was designed for more choral music. And they use a worship band now. So he said, the sound was so bouncy and it was kind of, it was hard. He said, until the sound person from Shoreline Church came over and spent hours and hours and hours helping us make our sound better in our worship center. That's Dale, who's now with Jesus. But part of what he sent ahead 
It was the time he put into that. And you know what? He didn't use his own time. He used his church work time. Wait, wait, pastor, pastor, we're paying him to do sound for Shoreline? And you're sending him over to other churches? The enemy? No. We're sending him to our brothers and sisters in Jesus and taking the best of what we have and trying to help other churches. Then another pastor in our group, the pastor of Monterey Church, we talked about the fact that when that church was started, when that church was a new church plant, their first sound system was a gift from guess what church? Shoreline Church gave a new church in town their first sound system. Who does that? There's churches out there like that, and you're part of one of those churches. Do you know that Shoreline Church, we partner with the public schools. To, we, we bring them gifts. We encourage them. We offer to do service projects for public schools. We, we partner with home schools. There's a couple of homeschool groups that through the years have met in this building. You know we charge them to use our building? Nothing, which means it costs us because we, we are paying for the maintenance of this building and we offer it to them for free. And we're the top supporter of the primary fifth grade through 12th grade Christian school in Monterey. This church supports financially. Wait, wait, wait. You support the public schools and the Christian schools and, and the home schools? What's the answer? Of course, we love kids. Jesus, lo- Jesus said, let the little ones come to me. There's churches like that out there, and I want you to know that you're one of those churches. God takes delight in that because he looks and sees that we have the capacity to be lavish with others because he has been lavish with us. God fills us up so we can overflow. So, Lord, this is our prayer. This is our prayer today as we open your word, as we open to Matthew chapter 6, part of the Sermon on the Mount, the most important, powerful sermon ever preached in the history of the world, Lord. We, we want to listen to the words of you, Lord Jesus Christ, today. Speak to our hearts. Drop our resistances. Drop our cautions. And help us hear your word. Speak to our hearts today. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at a number of different passages here in this chapter. Then one outside of Matthew 6, but we're going to kind of linger here in Matthew 6, and we're going to see what Jesus has to say. Jesus, who has been lavish, so lavish he gave us his own life on a cross, so lavish that he laid his life down for us, so so lavish that, that he who had everything gave it all up and came among us so we could have everything. That's our Lord Jesus. And he's speaking in Matthew chapter 6. This is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And we read these words in Matthew 6, beginning in verse 2. Jesus says, so... When, so when you give to the needy, notice that second word. Not if, but when. That's the the assumption of Jesus for his followers. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets. Look at me. Don't do that. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. To be honored by others so everyone else will see them. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Here's the first lesson from Jesus on how to be lavish. Number one, recognize that you have more than others and share with quiet humility. Recognize that you can share something. You have more than somebody. You have more than probably a lot of people. But recognize that. And then with a humble heart, not doing the, look what I did. That's not the point. It's just living your life humbly generously, joyfully entering into the things that honor Jesus. Question for you. Who do you know or who do you encounter who has greater needs than you do? Do you ever bump into anyone who has greater needs than you do? And the answer is yes, for all of us. I talked last week about the fact that we so often we're looking at financial resources, we look at the House higher on the hill or the larger trailer or the bigger boat or you know, whatever it is that we have, there's always someone with more. But here's the question. Who do you encounter that you have enough to be a blessing to? Notice those people. Look for those people. They're around you. And then in Jesus' name, be willing to respond. I've known homeless people who've come to Shoreline Church and become followers of Jesus. And when they put their faith in Jesus, when they came to the cross, when they received his grace and his love, when they realized that God has been good to them, these homeless people, while still living on the streets, started helping out other homeless people who had less than them. That's the spirit of it. There's always someone you can help. And when you do, you shine the light and the presence of Jesus. Do you notice those people? And so here's a word of encouragement. 
And I want to encourage everyone in this. And you can find your own spot in the, kind of, in the continuum here. I want to encourage you to always be loaded up with something to give away. If you carry a purse, if you carry a wallet, have, and, and maybe, for you, you know, maybe for you it's a $5 bill. I can, I can put a $5 bill aside. And that $5 bill is not for me. It's right there in my purse. It's right there in my wallet. And it's there to give away. Well, I don't use a purse or wallet. I don't use actual cash. I can't do this. Okay, you probably have a phone. The phone probably has a cover on it. Peel the cover off. Take that $5 bill. Fold it up in thirds. Put it in the back. Close it up. And there it is. I don't handle money. You can handle it. Okay? Maybe for you it's a $10 bill. Maybe for you it's a $20 bill. Maybe for you it's a $50 bill. Maybe for you it's a $100 bill. But always have something loaded up so that when you're walking through your day and you see a need, you'll see lots of needs. When you see the need, you pause. And you pray, Lord, is that need for me? Is that a need that I can meet? Maybe it's a server at a restaurant who just is working so hard, pouring themselves out. And you get interact with them and you just have a sense there's a need there. So you give your regular tip and you sort of add that along with it. And you, think, you keep that 20 in there, you take it out, and you say, well, that's my tip. And I just want to give you an extra 20 just to say God bless you. And just, I love, you work so hard. You should be proud of yourself. That's just an encouragement. God can use that to be a blessing. God can use it to touch their heart and to encourage them. And then, if you do that, when you go back home again, within, within a day or so, reload. Okay, put another 20 in. It's, and then you go, that's not for me. It's not for me. Now, if you get stuck and you run out of gas and you're, you're in the middle of a desert, yeah, you can buy a gallon of gas. But, but otherwise, that's where it stays. Here's, the, here's what happens when you do this. You, start, you realize that's been set aside. And that's not for me. That's for somebody in the flow of life that I encounter. And the Holy Spirit stirs my heart. And and it's easy to give away. You know why? Because it's not yours. It's easy to give away someone else's stuff, right? So just offer that to the Lord. Just just an idea. Find out that right number for you and always have it there. And you say, well, what if if I have a 10 in there? And what if God shows me three times in one week to give it away? Then you're going to walk in joy. Nothing will bring you more joy then respond to the Holy Spirit and let him use you to be a blessing to others. There's always people with a need. So lesson number one, recognize that you have more than others and share with quiet humility. Continue on, Matthew chapter six, verses three and four. Jesus continues, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. We'll get to it in a minute to what that means. It's kind of a funny thing to say. It's like, oh, I don't, oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to hide it from you. And it says, we're not getting silly like that. There's a, there's a metaphor. There's a meaning here, all right? Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. How to, be a, how to live a lavish life. Second lesson. Let your reward be from God and not from people. Let your reward for living a generous life be from God. In other words, don't let your giving being about showing off. In the ancient world, Jesus confronted the Pharisees. The Pharisees were were a sect. They were a group of, of religious leaders and religious people who were very, very religious, but they were really about laws, rules, and regulations, and they were really about showing off. And Jesus questioned them about how they did their Bible stuff, how they did their prayer stuff, how they did their giving stuff. He said, don't do it to put on a show for people. Do it for God's glory. And so the lesson here is when you grow in generosity, don't let it be something that you're trying to do to show off for people. I want to impress people because Jesus Jesus says, if you're trying to impress people, he said, you will. But that's your reward. Do it to glorify God. Now, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. What's going on there? Here's what some people say. Some people say, I could never talk about giving, never even utter a word about it. I want all the credit for me. And so I'm not gonna let anybody know what I ever, ever what I do. Is that what Jesus is saying? I don't believe he is. I believe we should talk about generosity. I have many people say, well, you shouldn't even preach about this, Pastor. You should never talk about you should never talk to somebody about your own personal giving, because then you're losing your reward. No, you shouldn't do it to show off and to brag. But when my three boys were growing up, when Sharon and I were raising our three boys, we talked to them a lot about giving. We talked to them about learning. We, how, how are they going to learn to be generous people if we don't model it for them? How do we model it without showing them what we're doing? We, we taught our boys. I do the same thing with, with, we'll talk with our board members about giving at times. That's one of the groups I have influence on in the church I encourage and pour into, our staff. I will challenge people who are on our staff and on our board to be generous. And, and, I'll, and I'll expect them to grow in that. Why? Because that's part of our spiritual journey. So, well, pastor, that's none of your business. Well, no, what I shouldn't be doing is bragging about things. What I should be doing is challenging people to live like Jesus. Amen? That was pathetic. 
That's one of the worst, that's one of the worst requested amens I've ever gotten in all my life as a pastor. I shouldn't brag about giving, but I should challenge and help people grow to be more like Jesus in their generosity. Can someone say amen? amen. Okay, did you really mean that though? That's what I want to know. Did you? Really, um, that's that's part of the call. That's part of the call. I wasn't going to share this. It's not in my notes, but since I've been pastor here, I've had two different times. At the end of every year, I ask our person who handles finances, is there anyone on our staff who's not living a joyfully generous life as far as we can tell and not giving towards the work of Jesus as far as we know that I should have a talk with? He said, well, pastor, that's none of your business. Well, you're wrong. It is. I'm called to give spiritual leadership in this church. And if we have people in leadership who aren't living out the way God's called them to live, it should be challenged in every aspect of their spiritual lives. Those two pastors, when I've sat with them and challenged them, both gave me very specific reasons why, you know, they, they kind of fear of the future, concern about they, would they have enough, would God provide for them, I haven't gotten in the habit of it. And I, I, I ask our financial person, just give me a name and if I should talk with them, that's their part. Then I sit with them and say, hey, talk to me about this. One time I talked with one of our pastors, and he said, actually, uh, there's somebody who's going through seminary right now, getting ready to be a pastor, and we felt called to give our giving to that person to help them out in this season. Is that okay? And I said, oh, absolutely. It's got to be for the work of Jesus. It doesn't have to be at Shoreline. If you're on staff here, you probably ought to give something here at some point. But, you know, and he said, well, for the next two years, we're going to give most of our giving there. Totally fine. But then I kind of understood that they were being joyfully generous. It was just kind of somewhere else. That's okay. But with these other two pastors, they just weren't living the way God wanted them to live. Both of them changed their lifestyles. And both of them, on many occasions, have come back and said, thank you for challenging me and raising that in front of me. It was something I was not dealing with. I wasn't being right before the Lord. And both of them have said, I find so much joy in giving that I, never, I would have missed. And, and so, so not only your left hand know what your right hand is doing, it's about don't do it where I'm putting my, you know, these together and putting on a show for everybody and trying to have human praise. But you can talk about generosity if you're helping somebody else grow in it and you're not trying to show off. You just have to check your own heart and make sure your heart's in the right place. Second lesson, let your reward be from God and not from people. Keep your focus. So here's a question. Do you know that God delights in your acts of generosity? Whether they're regular, you know, kind of set up giving where you give every week or every month, God rejoices. But also when you see a need and God stirs your heart and you give, God delights in our generosity. You know why? Because he's been generous to us. And when you start to be generous with others, God goes like this. God goes like this. They get it. They recognize how good I've been to them. And we hold everything to ourselves, and then God's kind of like, you don't get it yet, do you? You don't see how good I've been to you. You don't see how lavish I've been with you. You don't see that I'll take care of you. Trust me. And so for some of you, here's a challenge. Start somewhere. Maybe it's tucking five bucks away in your wallet or in your purse to give away. Maybe it's giving something each week to, to hear it. If you're online, you're part of another church, your local church, giving something there. But start somewhere. How much? Start somewhere. Get into a lifestyle and watch what God does. Continuing on in Matthew chapter six. Let's go to verse 19. Jesus is still teaching this crowd of people that are listening, that are learning. And he moves to another theme. Chapter six, verse 19 says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Jesus says to his followers, to the crowds, it applies to us. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. And then bottom line, this is huge. Look at the next, next part of that passage. For where your treasure is, There your heart will be also. You want to know where my heart is? Look what I invest in. You want to know where my heart is? Look how I spend the resources God puts into my care. It reflects something. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. That one works frontwards and backwards. Third lesson in how to be lavish. Grow a heart that wants to invest in heavenly treasures and not just earthly things. Say, God, grow a heart in me it doesn't just want an earthly human portfolio. Here's what I have. Here's what I own. Here's my net worth. But I'm investing in eternity. Now, if you, if you do a deep dive study in, Amer in the American economy, a lot of people's net worth is actually zero or negative. If you take what they owe the bank for the car and they owe the bank for the, you know, for the house or whatever, you go, okay, so maybe I'm not storing up that much here on earth after all. But are you storing anything up in heaven? Are you storing up things that will last forever? 
that no one can take away from you. Because Jesus is serious about this. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where moth and vermin destroy, or thieves break in and steal. You know, you can store up, store up, store up, but that, that can be burned up. That can go away. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths, I memorized this as a, young, as a younger Christian, where, where moth and rust, but moth and vermin do not destroy it. Things that eat things up and destroy things. Uh, where thieves do not break in the steel. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So here's a question for you. What does your heavenly portfolio look like? What does your heavenly portfolio look like? You know, you can look and say, oh, I know what I have on the earth. I know what I own, what I have. It's a little modest amount. It's a medium amount. It's a big amount. It's a crazy large amount. But, and, and, and ha, you know, saving for the future, helping your children, all, those are all good things. This is, this is not a message, and Jesus was not against financial resources or being responsible. But he was for everyone who believed in him and followed him, learning to recognize that God had been lavish with them, and they in turn could be lavish with others. And so what does it look like as you begin to build a heavenly portfolio? Well, when you invest in people, people you know, what lasts forever? What lasts forever? People. We're told that the word of God lasts forever. It's eternal in the heavens. The work of God's church to bring people to the, to, to, to the gospels, the spread of the gospel, that lasts forever. There are certain things that last forever and ever and ever. Are you investing in those sorts of things? You know, where do I focus my time and my energy and my resources? What am I building that's going to last forever? And, and when you can answer that question, you can say, you know, there's things that I'm pouring into, things that I'm investing in that will last forever. You can say, okay, I'm building that heavenly portfolio. Not, it's not like you get to have one day and say, okay, let me see all the stuff I saved up. That's not the point. The point is there's things you invest in that are temporary. That's okay. But make sure you're investing in things that last forever. Let me give you some examples, things to think about. When you give to the work of the local church, I grew up in a non-believing home. I didn't go to church. When I became a Christian, got introduced to the church, I thought, this is the, when I went to the church, I thought, this is the coolest thing ever. These people get together. They all love Jesus. They encourage each other. They sing songs of praise. They learn from the Bible together. They become, I, I love the church. I have since I became a Christian. I love the body of Christ, the people of God. And when you support what's happening in a local church, in this local church, here's what you're investing in, children. Every time you give to Shoreline Church, you are impacting the lives of children because there's a bunch of kids part of this church. From the littlest of kids in the nursery to the younger kids to middle school to high school. We're just starting this, this Shoreline 4-5, this fourth and fifth grade ministry. We're launching a whole new ministry. It's going to cost something to do that, but we want to reach those four and fourth and fifth graders. Middle school, high school, young adults. We have young adults that meet regularly and are gathering. Who's investing in the next generation? And all of our, all of our looking at the world saying, oh, man, the world's so messed up. Who's offering something different for them? The local church. And Shoreline Church is touching every age group. When you give, you're investing in eternity. When you support a ministry like Compassion International, if you, if you give to a child every month through Compassion, they're learning about Jesus, they have basic food, they have basic health care, they're, they're, they're connected in a, in a local church. It's, it's kind of a holistic approach. If you give a Christmas gift or a birthday gift, you can remind them about Jesus. And most of all, you get a chance to write them letters and share Jesus with them and encourage them. That's investing in eternity. Back to Shoreline. I'm going, to, I'm going to go local and then further out. Local, just give you some examples. You want to invest in eternity when you give to Shoreline. I don't do this for free. Say, Pastor, you should be a pastor for free. I'd love to be, but my wife has needs. No. <laughs> That's not in my notes. Sorry, Cher. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we got to pay the PG&E bill at home. We've got, you know, and, so, and so you say, well, that's just crass. You shouldn't talk about that, Pastor. No, we, we have a staff in our church. We need to pay those people. But, but when the word is preached, when adult ministries are happening, when we're having Bible studies and people are leading and coordinating all those different ministries, we have a staff of people. When you give, you're making sure that we can pay the basic bills of running a church so we can do the ministry we're called to do. That's investing in eternity because when the word is getting preached, we see people come to know Jesus regularly in this church. And every time you give, you're investing in those lives coming to know Jesus. Then go further out. World Mission. World Mission is another one of our partner ministries. This is called the Treasure. And this, this little, this little, see the little solar power on the back here? You put this out in the sun, it charges it. You turn it over here. The only thing on here is the Bible, the Word of God. In, in, in about 90% of the world's languages. And, and with every one of these that goes out somewhere in the world is listened to by an average of over 100, about 100 to 120 people. Because they have listening groups. And they take it from village to village in different parts of the world. We support that ministry through Shoreline. 
There's people that are hearing the Bible for the first time in their own language. Many of them can't read, but that's okay. You put this on, you hit play, and it reads the Bible to them in their own language. And the whole group can sit around and listen together. That's one of our partner ministries. That's one of our mission partners. When you give, you're helping put these in the hands of people who are not hearing about Jesus. Some of the places these get put are places where less than 1% of the people have ever heard the name of Jesus. So there's power in that. You're part of that. When you give to the local church, it makes a difference. When you give, it goes beyond us. How do we do a food pantry? How do we have a clothing closet? Because our people are lavish. You give financially. The staff people, the staff person who runs the, the clothing pantry and the food pantry is on our staff. We pay that person so that person can live and get by. And then they help coordinate a ton of volunteers to do the food pantry. You're investing in eternity because we're offering prayer to every person who comes. We're offering a Bible to anyone who doesn't have one. Another one of our ministry partners is Organic Outreach International. Organic Outreach International is one of our primary mission partners. And did you know that about four months ago, a team was there supported by Shoreline Church's giving? It was in Africa. It was in Kenya, Uganda, and along the border of Somalia. And trained over 2,000 pastors in how to share the gospel. You're part of that. You're giving supports that. It makes that possible. In one location, when the team was flown in, this was right along the border of Somalia, all the Christians are being driven out of that part of the, so the pastors are along the border. They want to go back in and bring the gospel to a place that's very non-Christian, but right now they're driven out. So these pastors were going to gather, and our team went and trained them. Rented a plane, flew in, two trucks with mounted machine guns and guards, got the team, brought it in to a locked compound, pastors there, trained them, and they said, before it gets dark, we're getting you out of here on a plane and gone. You're part of that. If, if Shoreline Church did not support that ministry, that trip wouldn't have happened. And there's pastors in that challenging place that are waiting right on the border, and as soon as they can go back in, they're gonna go to a place that's less than half a percent Christian, and they're going back to bring the gospel, and you help train them. That's an eternal investment. That's what you're investing in. Those things make a difference. Those things will last forever. And I could go on and on. Matthew 6, 24, continuing the passage, looking at a fourth insight here. So Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Your soul, your heart can't be bound to and serving your first. You can't have two first loves. You can only have one first love. And Jesus says, is it God or is it stuff? The word mammon, in the original language, the word mammon is not so much money as much as stuff. Money and all that it buys. You can't be all about the stuff of this world as your first love or all about God as your first love. You have to choose. So how do you become lavish? A fourth insight from Jesus, from the Gospel of Matthew. Do a very serious master check. Just do a really serious master check. Check and say, who is master of my life? Who rules my life? Is it the stuff of this world, the accumulation of things? Or is it the God who is lavishly giving me all that I have and who's watching out for me and taking care of me? So I'm gonna ask that you just quiet your heart for a moment. If you wanna bow your head and close your eyes, you can, you don't have to. But I wanna ask that you quiet your heart. And I want you just to a answer a couple of questions that I think are very important. And, let, and you're going to do a self-assessment, just a little self-reflection on where is your treasure. Here's the first question. When I get extra money, what's my first thought? When I get extra money, what's my first thought? What can I do for me? Or what can I do for the Lord? And just reflect on that. Another question. If someone reviewed my spending for the past month, what would they say is my first love? If an independent person just looked at all my spending, what would they say? Oh, man, they love God before all things. Or, oh, it's about the stuff. Another question. What gives me great joy? Spending on me? or spending on those who need to know Jesus? What gives me the greatest joy? Investing in me and what I like and want or the world and what Jesus wants for them? What stirs you up and brings you joy? Another question. 
in a normal month? How much do I spend and invest on things that bring Jesus to the world and things that will last forever? In a normal month, what am I investing in the things that last forever? And then one more question. In quiet moments when I'm just kind of wandering around in the hallways of my mind, um, what do I think about? What do I ponder? Making more money, getting more stuff, or using what God's already given me for the glory of Jesus? Listen to these words from 1 Timothy chapter 6 as your heart's in a place of prayer. Command those who have a lot, who have plenty in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Lord, may the truth of that scripture come alive in our hearts. May we recognize that you are a lavish God. You have been so good to us. And may your goodness so fill us that it overflows freely to every person we encounter. God, may we invest in the things that last forever as well as the things that last for one lifetime. Lord, stir our hearts. Keep us from shutting off a time of honest reflection about where we're at in our lives. And Lord, I pray that each person online and on campus today who hears this message or who listens to it online in months or years to come will have a new vision of your goodness, of your lavish love, of your provision and would live with open hearts and open hands, ready to share in a way that will change eternity and change today as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I invite you to stand for, to send you off with a word of blessing, I just want to give you a couple of invitations. First of all, uh, periodically, Sherry and I, after the morning service, will just be available to meet new people. So we're going to be out on the dock. If you go outside the, the doors here, over to the left, there's an area kind of by the Parkside room. We're going to go right over there. If we know you really well and we've got a friendship with you and we talk a lot, we love you, but leave us alone today. Because we, we want to meet. If you're new at Shoreline, come on by there. And just say hi. We'd love to meet with you, uh, greet you, and give a, have a personal time to connect with you. If you need prayer for anything at all, a joy or a need, our teams will be up front on campus, up front here in the worship center for prayer. And online, call the number you see there or email us your prayer needs, and our team will start praying for you right away. And if you're new at Shoreline, if you're new and online, just text the word welcome to the number you see right there, and we will reach out to you, give you a digital connection card, and try to connect with you wherever you are, anywhere in the world we want to connect with you. If you're on campus, before you leave, if you're new, just go by the Connection Center, and they want to give you a warm welcome, a personal greeting, and give you a little gift, and just thank you for being here. If you're able to stand online on campus, if you're able to stand, stand with me, and give me the honor of giving a blessing, and then give me a quick path out that way so I can sneak out and join my wife to greet new people. All right? As we close this time together, may you be amazed and stunned and overwhelmed by the lavish goodness of God. And may you overflow as a lavish person wherever you go. They're out there, lavish people. Be one of them today and every day and show the glory of God. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you right back here next Sunday.